Hey everyone, be sure to stay tuned until the end of this video where I show you how to take a picture of this distant star cluster, NGC 457, with a cell phone and this telescope. Hey everyone, John Reed here, professional amateur astronomer and author of 50 Things to See with a Telescope. I'm making this video because I'm intrigued by this new telescope from Celestron. They're calling it the StarSense Explorer TM LT 114AZ Smartphone App Enabled Newtonian Reflector Telescope. Woo! The idea is that you can use your phone to guide the scope to targets in the night sky. Well, I picked this telescope up on bnhphoto.com for exactly $100. So let's see if it works. This is Learn to Stargaze. So the StarSense lineup seems to have four different versions. There's an 80 millimeter refractor, a 102 millimeter refractor, this model, which is a 114 millimeter reflector, and then a larger 130 millimeter reflector. For those that don't know, reflectors use mirrors to collect light from space, while refractors use lenses. In the StarSense series, you have two low-end versions, labeled LT, and two high-end versions, labeled DX. In addition to the size difference, the DX editions come on mounts with slow motion controls, which are really great for getting the telescope pointed at the right place and tracking objects as they move across the sky. It also looks like the DX models give you the ability to connect large 2-inch diameter eyepieces. Now, when looking at these telescopes aside from the StarSense technology, the LT versions appear to be competitively priced, with prices currently around 200 US dollars, while the DX models, however, are coming in at around 400 US dollars, which seems high compared to their competitors, but I'm guessing Celestron is expecting the StarSense technology to make up the gap. Now, for this model specifically, the interesting thing for me is the focal ratio they've chosen. Focal ratio is focal length divided by aperture. This affects magnification as well as how bright objects will appear in your eye. Lower focal ratios offer less magnification but brighter views. High focal ratios, like in this one, offer high magnification but make it more difficult to make out details on faint objects like galaxies. Most small Newtonian telescopes seem to be at around f4 or f5. This scope is f9 which means that this telescope is really designed specifically for the moon and planets. The larger, more expensive 130 millimeter reflector is F5, which would perform much better on galaxies and nebula. So I've watched a few other reviews on this telescope on YouTube, and most of the reviews are glowing. The StarSense seems to work pretty well. Based on these videos, it looks like StarSense is picking out the best and brightest targets, which makes sense. But if you look at our night sky tonight at around 10 p.m., and this is October of 2020, we've got Jupiter and Saturn and Mars and the Moon, which are clearly the brightest objects in the sky, followed by the Pleiades rising in the east. Now, these types of targets are easy to find in any telescope, no star sense required. Now, where star sense would be awesome is in locating more obscure objects, like galaxies M81 and M82, which are a little bit more difficult to find. That said, this scope is targeted at beginners, and I think the reason these scopes review well is that they're targeted at folks who just want to see the moon and the rings of Saturn. If they see any deep sky objects like a galaxy, that's really a bonus. I'm actually really excited to see what this telescope can do. And if you have this telescope, or are thinking of purchasing it, I hope this video really helps you to get the most out of your new scope. So let's unbox this and see what we've got. Cue time lapse. So as I said, I bought this telescope used on bnhphoto.com, so it looks like some of it's been assembled already, but it looks like everything's here. We've got a 25 millimeter eyepiece providing 40 times magnification. We've also got a 10 millimeter eyepiece, and this will provide 100 times magnification. We've also got a 2x Barlow for doubling the magnification. Now for the most part, unless you're viewing the planets, the 25 millimeter eyepiece without the Barlow is the eyepiece you'll want to use the most. Use this eyepiece to find the targets and then zoom in by changing to the 10 millimeter eyepiece or adding the Barlow. Remember that you'll need to refocus the telescope after each eyepiece change. In addition to the StarSense iPhone holder, you've also got a basic red dot finder, which is actually my favorite method for finding objects in the night sky. Now it looks like the battery was already inserted, 
And if I turn it on, we can test to see if it works. And there you have it. You can see the red dot uh, through the finder right there. So we've got good battery in this. It's always smart to have replacement batteries for your finder on hand. These are 2032 batteries and they can be purchased at a dollar store. Now this is a Newtonian telescope and sometimes these telescopes need to be collimated, which simply means that the mirrors need to be lined up correctly. Now it does look like this telescope needs to be collimated. I'm wondering if maybe that's why the previous owner returned it to the store. But before I collimate this telescope, let's put it together, cue another time lapse. One cool feature is included in the mirror cover. So the center of the mirror cover comes off, and what this is for is so that if you're viewing the moon and it's really bright, you can put the mirror cover back on the telescope without the little central uh, puck here, and that will help with the brightness of the moon, making it easier to see. So the scope also comes with one slow motion control, and this controls slow motion in the altitude axis. This helps to track the target as it moves across the sky, but you'll also have to use a little bit of left-right motion as well. So I just realized that a laser collimation will not work for this telescope, and the reason is, and I'm gonna use a chopstick to demonstrate it here, there is a little correcting uh, lens of some sort inside the focusing assembly, and that disrupts the laser beam. So we'll need to collimate this telescope the old-fashioned way, and it looks like we're able to do that. So to collimate or align the mirrors the old-fashioned way, I've drilled a hole in the center of the eyepiece hole cover, and what you're gonna do is place this uh, where it goes in, in the eyepiece slot, and you're gonna look in, and the first thing you're gonna wanna do is just make sure that you can see the mirror clips on the primary mirror at the back of the telescope, and you wanna make sure that those are spaced evenly along the sides of your uh, field of view when you look in. If the mirror clips on the primary mirror are not all equally spaced around the circumference of your field of view, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take off this little cap here in the center of um, the spider assembly and you have a central screw, you're gonna loosen that and then with an Allen wrench, you're going to adjust the, the three adjustment screws here until those mirror clips are centered. Hopefully, you don't have to do this. Um, this should have been done at the factory and should stay in place for the life of the telescope. The second thing you wanna do is look in and compare the lengths of these spider arms. They should all be of equal length. If they're not, what you do is you need to loosen these three screws here that hold the mirror in place and then use these adjustment knobs until the spider arms are all the same length when you're looking in here. And so let's do that now. So now the telescope is collimated. I'm going to re-tighten these three screws at the back. And then I'm gonna check once more just to make sure the spider arms are of equal length. They are. Now that the telescope is assembled, we can take it outside and prepare the scope for viewing the night sky. So the most important thing about setting up a telescope is making sure that the finder scope and the eyepiece are pointed at exactly the same spot in the sky. So we've got Mars here, so I'm gonna use Mars. So the first thing I always do is check the red dot finder and make sure that that is pointed perfectly at the target. Now that doesn't mean now if I go to the eyepiece that Mars will be in here and centered, but we can check. So what I'm gonna do is just take a second to center that. Okay, so now that Mars is centered in the eyepiece, we're gonna go back to the finder scope, or in this case, red dot finder, and we're gonna adjust a knob here and a knob here until Mars is centered. Now this telescope is good to go for the night and we can move on to the star sets. Now that the telescope is set up, it's time to set up the app. You're gonna download it from the App Store and then type in your unique code. So when you've turned the StarSense app on, you're gonna put 
the star sets onto the telescope. I know this is a little hard to see, but bear with me here. So the mirror cap has been taken off, so you should be able to see the mirror right above the phone. Now, so I've just opened the app, and the first thing we want to do is hit this button at the bottom here. And then we want to say, needs alignment. You're going to hit night mode to on, and it's going to show the sky. Now, if it doesn't show the sky, you've got the two adjustment knobs on the bottom, and that just means that the cell phone needs to be lined up to the sky. So I can go left, right, and up and down, and you'll see that after a second or so, the phone is adjusting. Okay. So after we've got most of the phone covered with an image of the sky, I can see Orion right here, for example. Hit next. Okay. Now what we need to do is get a bright star in the eyepiece. I'm going to use Betelgeuse. I'm going to make sure Betelgeuse is in the finder and Betelgeuse is centered in the eyepiece there. Now. Going back to the phone, you can zoom in using two fingers, and I'm gonna make sure that I place the crosshairs directly over that star, and click Done. Okay, now the telescope is gonna think about it for a moment. It's actually taking photos of the sky, and now as I move the telescope, it knows exactly where it is in the sky, and every time I stop, it takes more pictures and recalculates, so it never loses its position. Now we've got two options here for finding things. We can look at tonight's best, which is an okay list. Uh, it doesn't really tell you, in my case, what's behind the neighbor's house or behind my house or behind that tree. And, you know, so you sort of have to already know the sky already to be able to use this, I've found. So what I usually do is pick a list of targets ahead of time and then pick them out of the search. For example, one of my favorite targets, NGC, I'm just gonna search for 457. Search. Wow, there's a lot of 457s. NGC, 457. Search. There we go, the owl cluster. And now what you're gonna do is hit this button here at the bottom, locate. And then you just move the telescope, following the directions on the screen, until you've found your cluster. So basically you wanna get near the cluster, you wanna stop, it's gonna take another photo of the sky, and then you'll be able to fine tune the scope to just the right spot. So with the target perfectly centered in the app, we can see if it's centered in the eyepiece, not so much, but I know what I'm looking for, so then I can go and make the final adjustment right here. Okay, so now I've put a phone adapter on the telescope so you can see what this looks like. This cluster is nicknamed the E.T. cluster from the Steven Spielberg movie, and I'm sure you can picture E.T. looking at you with outstretched arms. Now I'm using an app called Nightcap set to video mode. It's taking one frame per second and that's controlled with the slider on the right and i've set the iso that's the slider on the left just so that the image looked as best as it could and now we all want to take pictures with our telescopes but with a scope this size your only practical option is with a cell phone now i've covered planetary and lunar images in several other videos so this time i wanted to try something a little different I've tried to take single pictures of clusters with this telescope, but none of them turned out very good at all. So I'm going to use a trick that a lot of astronomers use, and I'm going to use this video instead to create the image. Now I'm not sure you can see it here, but there are light clouds in the sky here. So bear with me on this. I'm sure if you try this yourself, your image will turn out even better than mine. All right, so now we've got the file from the phone onto the computer. And what we're going to do is turn this video into a picture. So I'm using a PC. You could do this as well on a Mac using software called Linkios. Now on the PC, we're going to use two pieces of software. The first is called PIPP, and the second is called Deep Sky Stacker. And you can find both these pieces of software free on the internet. The first thing I'm going to do is drag the video onto PIPP and you'll see a little demo of what the video looks like right here, just one frame. Now PIPP is used to turn this video into pictures. Now the video contains 168 frames, and the first thing I'm gonna do is just take the middle of those frames. So I'm gonna take from frame 
30 to frame 120. And that's so I don't get any shakiness from the first part of the video as the telescope settles down or shakiness from when I stopped the video. The other thing I can do is mess with some of these processing options and see what they do to the image. So for example, stretching the histogram um, brings out the stars a little more. We can see that there. Set histogram to black point. We can experiment and see what that does. Makes it a little bit darker as well. Let's keep that on. I'm also gonna crop the image. We can go back here. We can see that this image, or sorry, this video is 1920 pixels wide and 1000 uh, 78 pixels tall and so I'm going to crop the width to a thousand and the height to 900 and that will just eliminate some of that vignette that was around the original video okay I'm going to leave these settings alone in the output I'm going to make sure that this is a TIFF file so a TIFF file is just an image file uh, TIFF is popular in astronomy for editing uh, images leaving everything else the same. We're going to go over to processing and click start processing. And that just takes a second. And now we've got a file folder containing all the frames from that video as pictures. So now we can close PIPP, open Deep Sky Stacker. I'm going to control A to select all these pictures and drag them into Deep Sky Stacker. These are light frames. I'm going to cl click OK. Now, I don't use Deep Sky Stacker very much. Um, I only know the very, very basic, so I'm not gonna change any settings. All I'm going to do is select register, check pictures, and make sure that stack after registering is selected. That's all I'm gonna do. Okay, and now I'm gonna hit okay, and this will take about five minutes to process on my computer. Okay, and okay. All right, now we've got our final image. And now I know it looks a little overexposed. Don't worry about that. Just save this picture to file, name it. This is NGC 457, 457, save. And now we can go back here and see our image. There you have it. That looks pretty darn good. So now you could go into Photoshop and take out some of this noise if you want um, and brighten the stars. But ultimately you can see the difference between the picture that we got from the video and here is the picture I took by just hitting, um, a, taking a single exposure on the camera. So there's quite a quality difference right there. So here are my thoughts on both the telescope itself and the StarSense technology. First, the telescope. So for the moon and planets, this is an okay first telescope. It gets the job done. However, when you graduate to deep sky objects like nebula and star clusters, I found the telescope to be a little underpowered, even compared to telescopes of similar size. There are two reasons for this. The first is the extra glass inside the focuser. The extra lens is included to increase the magnification, but there's a trade-off. Let's say the extra lens is doubling the magnification, then objects will appear about four times as dim, which takes a lot of deep sky objects off the table. Now, the second reason is common to all small Newtonian telescopes. The secondary mirror is obstructing quite a bit of light. And for whatever reason, and maybe this is a little bit subjective, deep sky objects lack the contrast that you might see in a refractor telescope, that's the one with lenses, of a similar size. And then there's this mount. The mount is quite light, and I found that I had to move past my targets and then let the scope settle into place. I did find this tiny slow motion control helpful for compensating for the sloppy pointing. Now, the more expensive DX versions of this telescope have slow motion controls on both axes, and this would make those telescopes much easier to point. And the DX versions of these telescopes also have lower focal ratios and higher apertures, which means that deep sky objects will appear brighter, all other things being equal. And now on to StarSense. I'd have to say I'm impressed. StarSense is brilliant. It doesn't get you precisely on target, but it gets you pretty darn close. And the app just works and it works well. That said, when you get to the eyepiece, you still really have to know what you're looking for. 
star clusters, galaxies, and nebula appear fairly dim through any telescope. And if you don't know what to expect, it might be hard to know exactly what you're looking at. I also found the app hard to use when it was in night vision mode. But if you're using it without night vision turned on, then you're ruining your night vision and deep sky objects will be doubly hard to see. All said and done, I can't wait to continue testing star sense on more challenging targets. Maybe just not with this particular telescope. I have recommended the larger DX versions because I think at that price point, around 400 US dollars, those scopes offer the best value in a telescope with the assisted pointing that comes with the StarSense system. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video on the StarSense Explorer LT114AZ telescope. I try to post a new video about every week, so please subscribe so you don't miss the next one. And if you're having trouble getting to see cool stuff in your new telescope, please consider purchasing 50 things to see with the telescope. This book will teach you how to use your new telescope to see awesome stuff in the night sky. Well, everyone, until next time, the future is looking up.